continuing our discussions of software architecture in practice, let's take a look at one of the technologies that is beginning to become more popular. Um, and we expect it to have a significant impact on software architecture in the very near future. And that is quantum computing. We open with this quote from Wired. Uh, it states that a quantum computer can be compared to the airplane the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk in 1903. You know, the Wright brothers' early plane, which they called the Flyer, barely got off the ground. But it foretold a revolution in travel where we would now be able to take to the sky. Um, and really, quantum computing may be just as significant an enhancement to the computing era as the airplane was to travel and the ability to take to the skies. Now, it is hard and extremely difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future. But, you know, um, quantum computing is be growing and it's likely to become practical in the next five to 10 years. Um, you know, if you think about it, um, if you think about Moore's law, computers have gotten much, much faster over the past few years, um, you know, doubling in speed every so often, doubling in memory, doubling in a lot of their different capabilities, um, you know, storage, et cetera. Well, the quantum computing is yet another enhancement to computing capabilities. And in some cases, um, it may give us significant advantages. Um, you know, in 2019, Google announced that its quantum computer completed a complex computation in 200 seconds. And it claimed that same calculation would take even the most powerful supercomputer today approximately 10,000 years to do. Now, they may have been wrong in their computation of how long it would take a uh, traditional computer to perform the computations. But even still, uh, we do recognize that there's some algorithms that quantum computers can handle and process relatively efficiently that a traditional computer can't handle because the algorithm is just too complicated or relies on aspects of quantum computing that a classical computer doesn't understand. But having said that, you know, classical computers are still going to be better for some algorithms than quantum computers. Um, and so the question is, you know, probably we'll come to a situation where we'll specialize. We'll use classical computers for one range of problems and we'll use quantum computing for another range of problems. So let's talk a little bit about what quantum computers are all about. So we're going to talk about um, qubits. We'll talk a little about quantum teleportation. And yes, that's not a typo. We're talking about teleportation. Not Star Trek type teleportation where it's beam me up Scotty, but quantum teleportation. So we'll talk about what that is. Um, and then we'll just talk about why um, much of the interest around quantum computing has to do with computer security and specifically encryption. Um, and finally, we'll talk about some other areas for potential applications like min-max problems and so forth. Um, all right, so let's talk about quantum computers. Um, you know, we think that quantum computers are going to become practical in the next five to ten years. Um, they're generating interest because they're potential to perform classical computers and certain algorithms. But as I said, it's only going to be for certain algorithms. It's not going to replace all algorithms. And in fact, most of the time, we're going to continue to use classical computers for the long term. It's just for very specific algorithms um, that we might choose to use quantum computers. Now, the fundamental unit of calculation in a quantum computer is a unit of quantum information called a qubit. And, uh, or a QBIT, sometimes it's a QBIT. Um, and the quantum computer is all about manipulating qubits. Um, the best quantum computers in existence just recently went over 100 qubits in terms of the number of qubits they have. Now, a qubit, what is a qubit? So a qubit is characterized by 
not just being zeros and ones. If you think about a traditional bit, a traditional bit is zero or one. You know, and sometimes we think of it elect from an electric electricity perspective, where if it's one, there's electricity, and if there's zero, there's no electricity. Um, however, the qubit is different. But it has some similarities with uh, the bit. So if you think about how a traditional bit works, it's zero or one, you read the bit, you retrieve the data, and then you do something with it. A qubit, on the other hand, we don't know what its value is. Then we read the value, and then we know whether it's a zero or a one. All right, that makes sense. Well, well, let's stop there for a minute. All right, so imagine there's a bit. We haven't read its value yet. We don't know what it is. We read it, and then it's 0 or 1. So it sounds like a bit. It's just an unknown bit. Well, actually, we can do some characterization of this unknown bit. We can describe the probabilities that when you read this bit, whether or not that bit's going to be one or zero. We could say, for example, it's 50-50 that it's going to be zero or one. We could say it's 90% likely it'll be a one or 10% likely it'll be a, a zero and so on. And so actually, um, these items that we're going to characterize are probabilities of the measurements as well as um, a rotation uh, referred to as a phase of the qubit. Now, once you measure the qubit, then you know the value, and then that value is the value. Um, and if a qubit does have non-zero probabilities for 0 and 1, we claim that the qubit is in superposition. That is, it could be either one. Um, but it gives us another level to uh, manipulate the qubits if, if we know that's in that particular uh, status. Now, qubits have a concept known as entanglement. Um, and entanglement is what's actually going to lead to quantum teleportation. Um, but entanglement basically means that if we've got two unknown qubits, and if we read one of them or measure it, you know, we'll call it measure and read the same in this case, um, if we measure it, we determine whether or not this qubit is 0 or 1. Well, if I measure this qubit on the left and this other qubit on the right, it's going to have the same exact value when I measure the one on the left, then I say these two are entangled. That is, when I read one, they both have the same value. Now, it turns out that if you have entanglement, and I don't want to get into all the details of entanglement, but it could be at any distance. So you could have one qubit here on Earth. You could have another qubit on Mars. And if the two are entangled, when I read the one on Earth, it's the one on Mars will have the same measurement. You know, if the one on Earth is a zero, the one on Mars will be a zero. So this idea that we can have two and they're, you know, there's no doesn't matter the physical distance between the two, means we can send information around the world or around the universe at a speed faster than light, and that is the concept of quantum teleportation. This idea that if multiple qubits are entangled, and we read one, we can read the other, and this enables us to be able to read information. Uh, faster than the information can travel. Now, there are some disadvantages to using qubits. Um, the first thing is, is that you can't really copy a qubit. Why can't you copy a qubit? Well, um, there's a couple reasons. One is, is in part of copying it, you're going to read the value. And so now you no longer have probabilities. Now you just have a measured value. 
Um, and so actually what we do is if you are copying a qubit, basically you destroy the state of the first one and reading it, and now you display the state uh, for the new one. And so this copying the qubit's value is referred to as quantum teleportation. And so it is possible to use quantum teleportation to copy data from one place to another. Um, again, extremely fast, even faster than in light speed. Now, there's many key details I'm cutting out. This is not a class on physics, uh, so we're not going to dive into the details of quantum physics. But this is one of the, re the concepts that's really important uh, and why you might hear people talking about quantum teleportation. They're not talking about Scotty beam me up on Star Trek. What they're talking about is the ability to transfer information extremely far uh, with extremely far distances, uh, you know, in a faster than light uh, speed uh, approach. Um, and again, this sort of quantum teleportation depends on the earlier concept of entanglement that we talked about earlier. Um, and another interesting thing from a computer security perspective is these two qu qubits that are arguably communicating through entanglement, they're not relying on communications lines. So we don't even know how someone could intercept this information. Now, that being said, um, because quantum computing is so new, there is a tremendous amount of stuff that we don't know about how it will work. Uh, when you go mainstream with this. And so I am sure there will be ways in which hackers will hack into quantum computers. We just don't know how they're going to do it yet. All right, well, but let's talk, now that we're talking about computer security and hackers, well, let's talk about one of the reasons why a lot of people are interested in quantum computing. Um, some of the first algorithms that were designed for quantum computers were algorithms for calculating the inverse of a, of a hash function. And there are many cases where the ability to calculate a the inverse of a hash function will be extremely useful. Um, uh, for example, in decrypting passwords. Um, just a reminder how hash functions work. Hash functions are typically a one-way function where using a traditional computer, uh, it's relatively efficient to perform the calculation in one direction, but it's extremely difficult to perform the calculation in the opposite direction, the inverse direction of the hash. And so we actually use hashes for um, security on the internet all the time. We use it for passwords. We use it for a lot of different things in modern computers, uh, digital signatures, uh, all kinds of different encryption. Well, all of those encryption algorithms are potentially vulnerable depending on how practical quantum computers get, because these quantum computers might be useful for performing the inverse of that one-way function in a way that a classical computer could not. You know, going back to the comment I made about Google's claim that they could perform uh, computations in 200 seconds that a classical computer would take 10,000 years to perform, that's the sort of thing that would crack many of our internet computer security algorithms. Um, so for example, um, Shor's algorithm is a quantum algorithm that can factor two primes with a running time on the order of, of log of the number of bits in P and Q, which is much faster than a classical computer could do. And some of our encryption algorithms rely on it being difficult to factor the product of two primes. Uh, for example, the RSA algorithm. Now that being said, um, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technologies, is working on a new set of encryption algorithms that will hopefully be more resistant to quantum computers than our current set of internet uh, security standards. Um, and that process is ongoing as I record this. There are a lot of potential applications for quantum computers, whether we're talking cybersecurity, 
uh, min-max algorithms for like financial modeling, medicine development, uh, weather forecasting, and the list goes on. Uh, now, many of these algorithms are still in the early stages, um, and we'll have to see over time which of these algorithms will really uh, be efficient once we have practical quantum computers, which again, we're probably several years away from. So, you know, just to kind of close up, there is a lot of potential applications. Um, generally, I think it's going to be along uh, lines of algorithms where traditional classical computers were failing. And perhaps the fact that uh, the qubits have this uh, probability function between 0 and 1 helps to create a program that more moderns real life than a classical computer could handle. Uh, we're likely to see a lot of this in the min-max areas, uh, in the computer security areas with the one with the inverse of the one-way functions, and in you know other areas where quantum computers enables us to do things we couldn't do with classical computers. Um, I don't really expect to see practical use of qu of quantum computers for at least five years, but uh, it'll be very exciting to see as these things become more popular. And you can already um, go and check out um, quantum computers. There are many of the major cloud vendors provide a quantum computer service. So you could try using a quantum computer for, uh, by using their cloud service. There are also quantum computer simulators that are available on the internet. So you can interact with a simulator to see how a simulator would write a program. Uh, if you wrote a quantum computer program. And in fact, there are quantum computer programming libraries that are available. Both Microsoft and IBM and other vendors make quantum computing uh, programming libraries available. So you can try out quantum computing on your own personal computer at home and then run it, th run the program through a simulator if you're interested. So there's a lot of cool technologies out there. So feel free to check it out and learn about quantum computers. Um, and yes, I, I do expect, uh, within our lifetimes, we will definitely see quantum computers doing some amazing things.